Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number six, The Two Witnesses, ready for teaching on May 11. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 4. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're looking at your word. We're looking at what the Bible says. We're looking at what you tell us through your word. We're looking at salvation that is available for each of us just so freely because of the death of Christ. But we need our commitment to you to be able to share it with those about us. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that you will be with us, that your word will not just speak to us, but that we may listen and hear, and your Holy Spirit will guide the way the word enters us, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will guide our actions and that we may have a closer walk with you day by day. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Sister Catherine and those who are deaf, for Sandra Robertson and her family, for Thelma Ray and family in St. Thomas, for Hazelyn Balliston and her family, for the beautiful Morant Church, Morant Bay Church uh, in St. Thomas, and also their evangelistic outreach in 2024. And for all of the local churches around the world, sharing your love and your grace in the Advent message around the world. Lord, we just pray that you will not only bless us individually, but bless our churches. Help us as we open your word, that we may see the love of Jesus once again. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's read that again. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Throughout the centuries, God's word has been dissected, doubted and discarded. It has been chained in monasteries, burned in public squares and torn to shreds. Its believers have been ridiculed, mocked, imprisoned and even martyred. Throughout it all, God's word has prevailed. The medieval church persecuted faithful, Bible-believing Christians, yet God's word illuminated the darkness. Oppression and persecution did not stop the proclamation of the word of God. As English Bible translator William Tyndale was tried for his faith, he was asked who aided him most in spreading God's word. He pondered the question and then answered, The Bishop of Durham! The magistrates were shocked. Tyndale explained that on one occasion the bishop purchased a supply of his English Bible translation and publicly burned them. What the bishop did not know at the time was that he was greatly aiding the cause of truth. He had purchased the Bibles at a much higher price than usual. With such a large purchase, Tyndale was able to print many more Bibles than were burned. Truth, crushed in the dust, has risen again and again to shine in all its brilliance. This week, we explore one of the most vicious attacks on the Scriptures and the Christian faith. During the French Revolution, blood flowed in the streets of France. The guillotine was set up in Paris's public square and thousands were slaughtered. Atheism became the state religion. Nevertheless, the witness of God's Word could not be silenced. Sunday, Sunday, May 5, Two Witnesses. Read Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 to 6. List five identifying features of the two witnesses you discover in this passage. Revelation 11, beginning at verse 3, And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. 
If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. In Zechariah chapter 4, the prophet saw two olive trees on either side of a golden lampstand, the same imagery that we find here in Revelation 11. Zechariah is told that this represents the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth in verse 14. The olive trees feed oil into the lampstand so that it continues to give light. We are reminded of what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. As we read in Zechariah 4 and verse 2, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And verse 6, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. John's vision in Revelation 11 is describing God's word being proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit to lighten the world. These two witnesses can prophesy and keep rain from falling for as long as they predict. They can turn water to blood and smite the earth with plagues. By the word of God, Elijah said no rain would fall on Israel, and in answer to his prayer, there was no rain for three and a half years, as you read in James 5.17. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then, He prayed to God, and rain returned after the false prophets of Baal failed to end the drought. And you reread that story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and chapter 18. Moses, through the word of God, brought plagues of all kinds on the Egyptians, including turning water to blood, because Pharaoh refused to let God's people go free. And that story is in Exodus chapter 7. Those who seek to harm the Scriptures will be consumed by the fire that comes from their mouth. God says in Jeremiah 5.14, Because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. God's word pronounces judgments upon all those who reject it. His word is like fire in the mouth. In John 5.39, Jesus declares that the Old Testament scriptures testify or bear witness of him. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. He also says that the gospel will be proclaimed as a witness to the whole world in Matthew 24 verse 14. And the New Testament, together with the Old Testament, is the basis of that witness. A word from the same root, martyrs, as the word for witness used in these two verses, appears in Revelation 11 verse 3. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Who are these two witnesses? In view of these biblical points, and the characteristics given in Revelation 11, We can conclude, not dogmatically, however, that the two witnesses are the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments communicating God's light and truth to the world. And so to finish today, many Christians today tend to downplay the Old Testament, to label it irrelevant and not needed, because we have the New Testament. What is so terribly wrong with that attitude?
Monday, May 6, Prophetic Time Periods Compare Revelation 11 verse 3 into Revelation 12 verses 5, 6, 14 and 15 with Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. What similarities do you see in these prophetic periods? First of all, Revelation 11 verse 3, And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. And Revelation 12 verses 5 and 6, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And Revelation 12, verses 14 to 15, The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. And then Daniel 7, verse 25, He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. The two witnesses will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, we read in Revelation 11, verse 3. This is the same time period as the 42 months during which the Gentiles, those who oppose God's truth, will tread the holy city underfoot, as we read in Revelation 11, verse 2. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for... 42 months. The enemies of God tread underfoot God's truth for 1,260 days. That's 42 by 30 equals 1,260. Each day symbolizing a year in apocalyptic prophecy. And God's two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments, prophesy against them during this same time. As we already have seen in Lesson 4, Daniel 7.25 says the little horn power that would arise out of the breakup of the Roman Empire would persecute God's people for a time and times, literally two times, and half a time. A time is one year, 360 days, so three and a half times equals 1,260 days. Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 13 talks about 1,260 days of persecution for the people of God. Verse 6 reads, The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And then verse 13, When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14 talks of a time, times and half a time. Revelation 13 verse 5 talks about 42 months. We find both 42 months and 1,260 days mentioned in Revelation 11 verses 2 and 3. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These prophecies describe different aspects of the same historical time period. When the authority of Scripture is neglected, other human authorities arise instead. This often leads to persecution of those who uphold the Word of God, which happened during the time of papal domination from AD 538 to AD 1798, when the medieval church descended into deep spiritual darkness. The decrees of men substituted for the commandments of God. 
human traditions overshadow the simplicity of the gospel. The Roman Church united with the secular power to extend its authority over all of Europe. During these 1,260 years, the word of God, his two witnesses, were clothed in sackcloth. Their truths were hidden under a vast pile of tradition and ritual. These two witnesses still prophesied. The Bible still spoke. Even amid this spiritual darkness, God's word was preserved. There were those who cherished it and lived by its precepts. But in comparison to the masses in Europe, they were few. The Waldenses, John Huss, Jerome, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, John and Charles Wesley, and a host of other reformers were faithful to God's word as they understood it. So to finish the day, what are some of the teachings today held by other Christians that are based on tradition and not on the word of God? Tuesday, May 7, the two witnesses are killed. Read Revelation 11, verses 7 to 9, remembering that the language is symbolic. What do these verses predict would happen to God's two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments? Revelation 11, beginning at verse 7. Now, when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse their burial. By AD 538, the pagan Roman Empire had collapsed. Justinian, the Roman Emperor, surrendered civil, political and religious authority to Pope Vigilus. The long period of the medieval church's domination began. It continued until AD 1798. The French general Berthier, on orders from Napoleon, marched unopposed into Rome on February 10, 1798. Pope Pius VI was taken captive and brought back to France, where he died. This date marks a prophetically predicted end of the Roman Church's secular authority, the 1,260 days or years as depicted in Daniel and Revelation, as we saw in yesterday's study. What a powerful manifestation of the truth of biblical prophecy. Daniel, writing more than 500 years before Christ, so accurately predicted events more than 2,300 years later. We can indeed trust the prophecies given in the Bible. Meanwhile, during all this, the truth of the gospel was kept alive by the witness of the word. But even greater challenges threatened biblical truth. The beast that ascended from the bottomless pit, Satan, made war against the scriptures. He initiated new assaults on the Bible's authority through the French Revolution that began in 1789. In the French Revolution, the government officially established the cult of reason as a state-sponsored atheistic religion intended to replace Christianity. A festival of reason was held nationwide on November 10, 1793. Churches across France were turned into temples of reason and a living woman was enthroned as the goddess of reason. Bibles were burnt in the streets, God was declared non-existent, and death was pronounced to be an endless sleep. Satan worked through godless men to kill God's two witnesses. Their dead bodies would lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, Revelation 11 verse 8. Egypt was a culture of many gods that denied the true God, as we see in Exodus 5 verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. 
Sodom represents gross immorality. In the French Revolution, God's two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments, lay dead as a result of the atheism and immorality that ran rampant as normal restraints were loosed in revolution and bloodshed. Revelation 11 verse 9 says that the bodies of God's two witnesses would lie unburied for three and a half days, that is, prophetic days, representing three and a half literal years. Atheism was at its height in the French Revolution, at least for about three and a half years. This period extended from November 26, 1793, when a decree issued in Paris abolished religion, to June 17, 1797, when the French government removed its restrictive religious laws. Wednesday, May 8. The Two Witnesses Resurrected Read Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. What prediction does this text make about the Word of God? Revelation 11, verse 11. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. At the end of the French Revolution, God's Word would figuratively come to life again. There would be a mighty revival. Great fear would fall on those who saw God's word once more become the living power of God unto salvation. At the end of the 18th century, God raised up men and women who were committed to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. People spread the message of the Bible rapidly. One such person was William Carey, who travelled to India and translated the Bible into dozens of local dialects. Propelled by the power of the Bible, missionaries were sent around the world. It is not by accident that these worldwide mission endeavours arose after the French Revolution. God's Word is a living Word, and although to many it seemed dead, it was still living in the hearts of believers and would rise again to full life, as Revelation's prophecies predicted. In The Great Controversy, page 288, we read, The infidel Voltaire once boastingly said, I am weary of hearing people repeat that twelve men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Generations have passed since his death. Millions have joined in the war upon the Bible, but it is so far from being destroyed that where there were a hundred in Voltaire's time, there are now ten thousand, yes, a hundred thousand copies of the Book of God. In the words of an early reformer concerning the Christian church, the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. End of quote. Read Psalm 119, verse 89, and Psalm 111, verses 7 and 8. What do these passages tell us about the Bible and why we can trust it? Psalm 119, verse 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And Psalm 111, verses 7 and 8. The works of thy hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established for ever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. God's word may be attacked or suppressed, but it will never be eradicated. Even many professed Christians undermine its authority in various ways, questioning parts of the Bible or so emphasising the human elements that it all but loses its divine stamp and God's truth is undermined. We must never in any way allow ourselves to be seduced by these attacks on the Word of God. It is still alive today, speaking to human hearts, breathing new life into those who are willing to listen to the Word and follow its teachings. And so to finish today, a question. What prophecies in particular speak to you personally and why?
Thursday, May 9. Truth Triumphant Despite the attacks of the enemy, God's work on earth will come to a glorious climax. The gospel will be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, as it says in Revelation 14.6. The great controversy between Christ and Satan will end with Christ completely defeating the powers of hell. God's kingdom will triumph over evil, and sin will be eradicated forever from the universe. Revelation 11 begins with Satan's attempt through the French Revolution to destroy the Christian faith and eradicate belief in God. But the chapter ends with the triumph of God's kingdom over the principalities and powers of evil. It provides encouragement to all who go through fiery trials for the cause of Christ and His truth. Read Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. According to these verses, what events take place at the close of time when the seventh trumpet sounds? Revelation 11, beginning at verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders, who were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the the earth. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Christ is victorious. Evil is defeated. Jesus wins and Satan loses. Righteousness triumphs. Truth reigns. We would do well to heed the following instruction written in the Great Controversy, page 288. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown, but that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand for ever. End of quote. Read Revelation 11 verse 19. What did John see opened in heaven? And what did he see as he looked up into heaven? Revelation 11 verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. The temple of God in heaven was opened to John's view. As he gazed into the most holy place, he saw the ark of the covenant. In the Old Testament sanctuary, which was a type patterned after the great original in heaven, the glorious presence of God was revealed between the two angelic figures fashioned on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Within the Ark was the law of God. Although we are saved by grace alone through faith, obedience to God's law reveals whether our faith is genuine. The law of God is the basis or the standard of judgment, as we read in James 2.12. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. This fact becomes especially important and relevant at the end of time. As you read in Revelation 12, 17, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And Revelation 14, verse 12, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful faithful to Jesus. And so to finish today, how does the striking contrast between the godlessness of the French Revolution and the glorious climax pictured in Revelation 11 speak to us today? Friday, May 10. Further thought. 
From the Great Controversy, page 267 and 268, we read, When the Bible was proscribed by religious and secular authority, when its testimony was perverted and every effort made that men and demons could invent to turn the minds of the people from it, when those who dared proclaim its sacred truths were hunted, betrayed, tortured, buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith or compelled to flee to mountain fastnesses and to dens and caves of the earth, then the faithful witnesses prophesied in sackcloth. Yet they continued their testimony throughout the entire period of 1260 years. In the darkest times, there were faithful men who loved God's word and were jealous for his honour. To these loyal servants were given wisdom, power and authority to declare his truth during the whole of this time. End of quote. And then from page 286, when France publicly rejected God and set aside the Bible, wicked men and spirits of darkness exulted in their attainment of the object so long desired, a kingdom free from the restraints of the law of God. The restraining spirit of God, which imposes a check upon the cruel power of Satan, was in a great measure removed, and he whose only delight is the wretchedness of men was permitted to work his will. Those who had chosen the service of rebellion were left to reap its fruits until the land was filled with crimes too horrible for pen to trace. From the devastating provinces and ruined cities a terrible cry was heard, a cry of bitterest anguish. France was shaken as if by an earthquake. Religion, law, social order, the family, the state and the church – all were smitten down by the impious hand that had been lifted against the law of God. End of quote. And then from page 316, unless the church will follow on in his, that's God's opening providence, accepting every ray of light, performing every duty which may be revealed, religion will inevitably degenerate into the observance of forms and the spirit of vital godliness will disappear. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, how are the principles of the great controversy revealed in the French Revolution? Two, when arguing that there is no God, one person wrote that we are free to establish our own goals and to venture across any intellectual boundaries without looking for no trespassing signs. Why is that phrase, without looking for no trespassing signs, so instructive to the motives many have for rejecting God? How might such ideas help explain some of what happened in the French Revolution? And three... What is the significance of John's vision of the sanctuary as it relates to final events? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. One Angel, Four Encounters by Nelson Sinzo Rees Chitta Onga and Kalavit Sabonet Osifo. Few people can say that they have seen an angel. Oyel says he has seen an angel, not just once, but four times. Oyel slipped away from his childhood faith as he laboured for three years away from home, helping to construct a 250-mile or 400-kilometre road between the cities of Makuba and Nampula in Mozambique. It was tough work and he sought relief in ways that he knew violated God's law. One day, several strangers approached Oyel, who was drunk after work, and asked if he was aware that the Bible taught that the Sabbath was on the seventh day of the week. Oyel was convinced that the strangers were wrong. Prove it to me from the Bible, he said. The strangers, who introduced themselves as Seventh-day Adventists, opened the Bible to the fourth commandment and read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 in the New King James Version. Then they turned to Ezekiel 20:20 20, 20 and read, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, 
that you may know that I am the Lord your God, from the New King James Version. Oyel read and reread the verses over the next few days. He wondered if he was reading truth from God. Even though he had gone to church since he was a boy, he had never noticed the verses before. As he thought and prayed, a shining angel appeared at night over the house where he was staying. Strength, the angel said, you are on the right path. The next night he saw the angel again in the same place. Strength, the angel said, you are on the right path. The same thing happened the third night. Ayel went to an Adventist church the next Sabbath. After that, he worshipped regularly with the Adventists. When his three-year contract ended, Ayel returned home and was surprised to find that his wife and children had joined the Adventist church. He had had no contact with them during his extended absence. What a coincidence, his wife said, when she learned that Ayel had been going to an Adventist church. Is this by chance? But back home, Oyel went to the Adventist church on Saturdays and his childhood church on Sundays. He wasn't sure what to do. Then the angel appeared for a fourth time. What are you studying? What you are studying is true, the angel said. Oyel decided on the spot to become a Seventh day Adventist. There are few Adventists where Oyel lives, but God has blessed his efforts to share the good news that Jesus is coming soon. Oyel has helped start three house churches. Evangelize anyone, even if they're drunk, he said. God is the one who converts, and there are many people who God has prepared to accept the gospel. They only need to be touched by you.